So thank you, Cindy, for reading that long passage. And like I said, we're coming to the end, so trying to get through as much as we can, because what's happening here is really just like a couple of days worth of, of Jesus' life and, and what was just read. Like I said, Cindy just read for us the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. And, and so far in our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, we have seen and been witnesses to Jesus' earthly ministry from the beginning in Mark chapter 1 and where we're at here in Mark chapter 11. And all through this amazing yet succinct account of Jesus' life, we have seen Jesus interacting with people from all walks of life. And we have to think about that. He's interacted with the proper and perfect religious leaders to the most deplorable people on the face of the earth, the non-Jews, the Gentiles. He's, he's, he's dealt with them. We've seen Jesus cared for them all, each and every one of them. He really did. He cared for each one. God's love for all people shines through in the way that he lived and loved here on earth for those three years of his ministry. Now, that's not to say that Jesus went, just went from town to town, as we've seen, commending people for the way they're living. When he saw sinful actions, he called it out. And in, when he was faced with prideful people, he let them know they weren't all that. He healed the sick. He caused the lame to walk. He caused the blind to see. He raised the dead. And he taught his disciples how to do ministry and how to carry on his ministry after he was gone. See, Jesus answered the most difficult questions some people had, and he even answered questions that were designed solely for the purpose of getting him to answer in such a way that he would incriminate himself. One such question was like last Sunday as we looked about where Jesus was asked a question about divorce and remarriage. Difficult things, difficult problems, things to trip him up. So from that point in Mark chapter 10 that we was at last week to this morning's passage, a lot has happened. And I, and I kind of had to skip over some of this stuff because first, he once again told his disciples, we're heading to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be, I'm going to be tortured. They're going, to, they're going to put me on a cross. They're going to whip me. They're going to kill me. And after three days, I'll rise again. He told the, the disciples that. Jesus then had to put James and John in, in their place when they requested to be sitting next to him on, his, in his, on the throne in his glorious kingdom. Jesus plainly told him, you have no idea what you're asking for. You think that's what you want, but you really, I guarantee you, you really don't want that. You don't want that because of what you would have to endure. Jesus then healed a blind man named Bartimaeus. But most importantly... And the part I skipped was Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I skipped Palm Sunday because we usually go over this passage every year during the Easter season. And that leads us to our text here this morning in Mark chapter 11. So right before this, where we're at in, in verse 12 of chapter 11, the triumphal entry. Jesus comes riding in town on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we see here the next day. So that was Sunday. So the next day, Monday. As he's leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing on it but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say that. So, the triumphal entry in Jerusalem was on Sunday, verse 12, and this is the very next day, this is Monday, this is... Uh, think about this. This is Monday. By Friday, he's going to be crucified. Lots happening here. And so, this Monday, as they're walking towards Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem, the text also tells us that Jesus was hungry. He made it a point to make sure to let the disciples know he was hungry, and he made it a point to call out the obvious. Where's all the fruit? Where's all the fruit? Now, the fact is, we do see Jesus being hungry, and it's no accident because I believe this is a little bit of added information so that anyone who reads this, cannot, this account, who understands it, cannot come away with the idea and the known fact that Jesus is fully human. I mean, his disciples have followed Jesus for three years now. What they can't comprehend is this season of ministry is coming to an end. Even though Jesus just told him that 
I'm going to be going to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to try me. They're going to crucify me. I'll be tortured. It just hasn't all sunk in yet. I think for these 12 guys, they are probably the most confused group of individuals there has ever been. They've been learning. They've been growing. They've been serving. They've been doing all these things, but yet they're so confused at this point. One minute, Jesus is performing miracles like raising a little girl from the dead. So he has to be God, right? Because only God has the power of life and death. Then the next minute, Jesus is telling them that he's going to be executed in Jerusalem. And they have to be thinking this is impossible because God wouldn't allow that to happen. And then as we see here, Jesus is like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting hungry. Let's go get some figs off that tree over there. And so he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached that tree, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Well, duh. It's not the season, right? Why would anybody expect there to be any fruit from this tree? I read commentaries that said during this time of year, the fig would, would have like buds on it and the buds would be edible. And so that was what Jesus was looking for. And there was no buds on the tree. And maybe that's true. But the, the reason Jesus picked this tree at this particular time and raised the question of where's all the fruit is because Jesus is using this fig tree as an object lesson. This fig tree is an object lesson. Verse 12, the next day he was leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And the disciples heard him say that. Again, this incident is, is intentional. Everything Jesus does, everything Jesus says was intentional. It was a teachable moment for Jesus. His disciples heard Jesus speak a curse on this tree because there was no fruit found on it. The fruitless fig tree is an object lesson for the disciples to understand that this fig tree represents Israel. Where's the fruit? Where's all the fruit, Israel? Jesus is comparing this fruitless fig tree to fruitless Israel. Trees that bear fruit and have proper growth is expected in God's word. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seats of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever he does prospers. I love that passage. Because as God's people we shouldn't listen to what the world tells us is right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't try to follow the ways of the world. We don't need to join in in what everyone else is doing in the pleasures of this world. Instead, like Psalm 1 tells us, we should delight in God's word and meditate on it all the time. If we do that, we'll bear fruit. We'll be like a tree planted by the water. and Whatever we do that is within the will of God, we'll prosper. We will produce fruit in season. The metaphor Jesus is using here paints the picture that Israel hasn't stayed away from the ways of the world. They have not delighted in the law of the Lord. They have not planted themselves by the streams of waters like they were instructed to do. They've all been about all, the, all about themselves. It's all about me. It's all about us. It's all about us. Their religious leaders have made up their own rules to follow. Israel for a long time has not bore any fruit for many, many years. In fact, righteousness and holiness has given way to absolute corruption. And that's a huge problem. As I said earlier, as we've gone through Mark, Jesus calls out sin and sinful behavior. Yes, Jesus loves everyone, but he loves people enough to show them where they have gone wrong. He loves people enough to let them know that what they are doing and the way they are living isn't the best way to be living. He wants everyone to know and to see that there is a better way. And all it takes is trusting in him. What I want you to know is this. That if any time in this sermon series you felt convicted or you have disagreed with what was read or you didn't like something I said, then just know it wasn't from me, it was from the Holy Spirit. All this to say is if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus, then yes, Jesus loves you, but he loves you so much that he wants to change your old sinful ways 
into a better and growing life. God's love is not like a coddling, pampering kind of love. Like, I love you just the way you are. You just be you. That's what the world tells you. Jesus says, no, I love you so much. I want you to change. I want you to become a better you. God's love isn't a coddling love. It's a perfecting love where he says, I love you way too much to let you stay in that sinful way of life that's going to hurt you. See, Israel has not produced any kind of fruit for a long time. The religious system has been corrupted by men who are only in it for what they could get out of it. This absolute corruption of God's holy temple is a huge problem, and Jesus isn't going to put up with it any longer. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. What we're going to see here is that Jesus is upset that the temple and the men who run things there are not fulfilling their intended purpose. They're not fulfilling the purpose that God had given them. This is not what God set the temple system up for. This is not doing what they were supposed to be doing. Now, some believe that Jesus just like threw a fit, that he lost his mind, he went berserk, and he, he, he lost his mind and when he saw what was happening in the temple, and he just lost all control because he, he just got mad. But that doesn't fit his character. See, this is not the case. This is calculated event. This isn't some spur of the moment fit of rage. Jesus planned to throw these guys out. This was the sole reason he went there on this day. And you got to think about it. Like the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. Jesus is riding through the city. They're laying palm branches down. They're People are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as Jesus gets to the temple, and by the temple courts, he looks over and he sees all this corruption going on. These money changers and people selling doves and, and doing business there. He saw all that. And he rides by the temple courts, he looks over. And he sees the condition that his house is in. See, they were conducting business and ripping people off. What they were doing is that during this time, it was the Feast of the Passover, where many Jews made a trip to Jerusalem for this, for this solemn festival. And out-of-town folks and people who probably lived in the city, they didn't, they couldn't, the out-of-town folks couldn't really bring their livestock all that way. The people in the city couldn't have livestock anyway, so they would have to buy doves to sacrifice during this festival this festival. That's what they did. Uh, if you did bring an animal from out of town, maybe it wasn't acceptable. And so, so the priest would say, no, this isn't acceptable. You still have to buy our, our, our sacrifices. So these money changers and seller of doves provided a service to people who were there for the Passover. But the exchange rate, and the cost of acceptable sacrifices was always a lot more than they should have been. During Passovers, the prices were greatly inflated. Of course, the temple priests and the, the religious leaders, they got their fair share. They got their cut out of this. This was a great business. I mean, this is a great gig if you can get it, right? While all the corrupt business was going on, people were treating the temple as a shortcut even. between. See, the temple court, held it, it was huge. It was massive. It was, it was big, and so people would walk through it to get from one side of town to the other, and they would carry their wares through there. And what they were doing was they was treating this holy place like a marketplace. Jesus says, we ain't having any of that. So he threw out the money changers. He threw out the sellers of the dove. He stopped people from carrying their wares through the temple courts because they were not fulfilling the intended purpose that God had the temple built for. Which got me to thinking, are we? And what I mean is Calvary Baptist fulfilling the purpose that God has called us for. Are we doing all the things this church here in Pittsfield was originally planted for? And it goes without saying, churches are planted, right? IBSA plants churches all the time. 
This church was planted here back in the 1950s for a purpose, for an intended purpose. But are we still acting like that tree that was planted by the streams of water? Are we faithfully preaching and teaching and more importantly following the word of God? Because if we do, then we're going to bear fruit. If we don't, there will be no fruit. Where's all the fruit? Just like it says in Psalm 1 here. All that we do will prosper if we do these things, if we, if we do our intended purpose. So the question is, where's all the fruit? We are God's church. We are God's people. Do you have the fruit? 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 Do we, is the fruit within us all? Right? As a church, we're expected to grow and to produce more fruit in the, in the way of adding more Christians to the kingdom. So the church's intended purpose is to grow the kingdom. And as individuals, we have that same expectation as we grow and experience the fruit of changed and blessed lives. Individually, the fruit as we, we grow become more Christ-like. As we come together as the church, we grow the kingdom. That's what we're planted for. But to have that kind of blessing, sometimes the Lord needs to throw out some things that's in our lives that we like to hold on to. Sometimes those things are hard to let go of. Like, I'm sure these, these guys didn't like Jesus throwing out what, what they were doing at the temple. And sometimes, just like these religious leaders, we don't like it when Jesus tells us to get rid of our sinful ways. Verse 17. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. And what we see here is the chief priests and all the religious leaders had a fear of losing control. They feared Jesus because they're interfering with their way of life. He's interfering. Jesus is costing them money. Jesus was pulling people away from their influence. What was happening in the temple wasn't a surprise to Jesus. He knew everything they'd been doing. He, he knew all that, just like he knew what the, the disciples were talking about, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom that we looked at a few weeks ago. Nothing can escape the Lord. He's omniscient. He knows he sees it all. See, these temple leaders should know all of that. They're supposedly, they know God since they're offering people sacrifices to God. They're representing people to God. They should know God. And the people there were just there to worship. But these robbers are, are, are not only just robbing them of money, they're robbing them of their worship. Real worship. They're, these, they're robbing them of their real worship experience. So here's the thing. Don't let the actions of others rob you of real worship. Don't let what someone said or what someone did keep you from coming to church and worshiping your God. I say that because this happens way too often. I'll call someone up who hasn't been here for a while and I hear, well, pastor, somewhat the church offended me. They did something. They said something, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, you know. Don't worry about other people. Just come to God's house and worship him. These men here, though, were after Jesus because he was upsetting their whole system they had set up. They had a good thing going. And if they allowed Jesus to continue and teaching all these things, then these men would lose control. They thought of themselves that they were good men, they were good Jews, they were God's men, and they were temple leaders so they could do anything they wanted since they ran the place. And if anyone didn't like that fact, who cares? Well, Jesus cared. And because of this Jesus guy, they're going to lose control of everything they have. They'll no longer control the temple. They'll no longer control the people. They'll no longer control the money. And we can't have that now, can we? they thought. Verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, 
because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. What these evil men didn't understand is that they were going to lose it all anyway. Yes, we know we, that here in a, few, in a few weeks, as we're going to see, they did succeed in killing Jesus. But that was God's plan from the beginning. They just played right into God's plan. Verse 20. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. And what we have here in this set of verses is a lesson on faith and prayer. Triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Sunday. Cleansing the temple from the money changers and the, and the merchants on a Monday. Tuesday morning, Jesus is back teaching his disciples a very important lesson. There's a lot to get done. I mean, I mean in just a few, few, few short days, Jesus is going to be arrested and, and put on trial. Is there really time for Jesus to be going over this stuff again? Is there really time for Jesus to be teaching this lesson to his disciples? Well, obviously, yes. And this must be a very important lesson for them to learn and for us to learn as well. The fig tree that Jesus cursed was now dead. In just a few days, that fruitless tree was gone. It was dead. And you can't get, let nothing get past Peter here because he says, he remembered, he says, Rabbi, look, the tree you cursed is, has withered. Now to us with the written word and knowing all that has transpired in the rest of Mark and looking back and understanding things 2,000 years later, we know this fig tree represented Israel. It represented the fruitless people of God. It represents a destroyed temple in the nation of Israel. Because just 70 years after this object lesson of the fig tree, the temple was burned and torn down by the Romans. Israel as a nation ceased to exist 70 years after this. Think about that. The fig tree withered, died like that. 70 short years after this right here, Israel, gone, destroyed. That is until 1948, when Israel became a nation again. Think about that. Just 1900 years, there was no Israel. But just 76 short years ago, they reemerged. They reemerged literally from the ashes and through a lot of troubling times like the Holocaust. So make no mistake, God has a plan for Israel. As we see in our scriptures, Israel plays a significant role in end times. You think we're not in end times? We are. Israel's a nation just 76 years ago. That's a short amount of time. So all the trouble we see in Israel and Gaza and Lebanon and, and, and Hamas and Hezbollah and all of that, and all the trouble over in the Middle East isn't a surprise to God. He knows all things. And the day after Jesus cleansed the temple from all of that corruption, he was teaching his disciples. And what he was teaching them in Mark 11 here was that they needed to stay faithful to the mission. Look, Jesus said, or, or look, Jesus, Peter said, that fig tree you cursed is dead. And look how Jesus answered that announcement. Verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. That's a strange way to answer Peter's statement. Jesus, that fig tree, it's now dead. You cursed it the other day. Have faith in God. What a short but gigantic statement that Jesus proclaimed here. Having faith in God is the true source of everything we need. Trusting Jesus not only for our salvation, but everything else that we need in this life, here and now. It's what the Christian life's all about. Trusting in Jesus, trusting God, trusting for everything. So how do we as believers stay faithful to the mission that God has given us? Trust in God. 
Better yet, how do we as a church that has been planted here in Pittsfield for a specific intended purpose of reaching people and, and growing the kingdom, how does Calvary Baptist stay faithful to the mission God has for us? Trust in God. I don't mean trust in God for the big things like just a new building, which by the way, the only way that new building is going to happen is if we step out in faith. But we need to trust the Lord for all things. We need to ask him for that new building. We need to ask for the growth of our church. We need to ask for the, the, the financial needs to be met for our church. We need to ask for the new ministries to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, not doubt in any way, but fully expect all these things to happen. And they will, as long as individuals and a group of believers here stay faithful to the mission and don't give up. Because here's the thing, trusting in God has great power. Verse 23, I tell you the truth, if anyone says this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Jesus knew that through these next few days, all these men who had been with him for three years will need a lot of faith in God. They're going to have to they're going to have their faith tested. They're going to be put on display. They're going to, to be pulled in so many different directions. What are they going to need? Have faith in God. And so that's what's going to get them through all these tough times that's coming up. And Jesus used hyperbole here, and he used an exaggeration to show that what is possible if and only if you place your trust fully in the Lord. See, there are times in our life that are difficult and very trying. I don't know if you've ever been through any of those times, but I'm telling you, if you haven't, they're coming. Like, you get to the point where I just can't deal with this. I'll never be able to withstand what I know is coming, or I can't take one more minute of what I'm presently going through. This is impossible. I can't do it. I can't take anymore. Those kind of times are mountain-moving times. Seems sometimes moving a mountain would be easier than to get through what you have to do. Have faith in God. Stay faithful to the mission. And believe what you ask will happen. Now, I'm not starting some kind of new theology here at Calvary Baptist, name it and claim it and all that prosperity stuff. That's not what I'm saying. This is asking for what you need to complete our mission. This is knowing God's will for us and trusting that in what we ask God for, he will, he will give it. See, we have no reason to doubt because he will do it, it says. But also notice this. Good relationships include forgiveness. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is a very important teaching for Jesus to be given here because he felt that this needed to be said right before he went to the cross. The statement of Jesus is pretty self-explanatory. And when you stand there praying, if you held anything against anyone, forgive them. Why? So that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins. All this say we do sometimes struggle in life. And sometimes that struggle is our own fault because we hold on to wrongs. We can cause, what can cause us to struggle in church, too, is, is we struggle because of a church, with the, our church because we hold on to wrongs. We hold on to grudges. I've preached in churches where this person did this to that person 30 years ago, and they still can't sit on the same side of the church. Seriously. You want to know what happens to these churches? They die. They cease to exist. You see, having faith in God will meet your needs that you ask for is not only dependent on your faith, it depends on your heart and what's in your heart as well. These disciples here are very quickly are going to have a lot of things happen to them that they, have to, that they, could, hold, they could hold grudges for. Like Peter denied Jesus three times and, and when Jesus forgave him, the other disciples forgave him as well and counted him back on the mission. Verse 27. 
They arrived again in Jerusalem while Jesus was walking in the temple courts. The chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you what authority I'm doing these things. John baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people for everyone held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. King might think that Jesus throwing out the people in the temple and the money changers was the big confrontation, but the real confrontation is right here. This is the confrontation in the temple. As soon as Jesus walked back into the temple courts, these guys were waiting on him. They're like, as soon as Jesus walks in, we're going to get him. They, they couldn't wait to confront Jesus about what he did yesterday. This is a gang that's going to gang up on Jesus and his disciples. We, there's 13 of them. We better get a whole bunch of us. And they asked the question, who gave you the right? By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority to do this? Because basically what they're asking is, just who do you think you are, Jesus? What makes you think you can walk in here and throw people out and, and, and prevent people from walking through the temple? What they don't know is that in all things, Jesus had every right because he is God in the flesh. Colossians 1.15 says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The Nicene Creed, which many denominations read every week during their worship, says concerning Jesus that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. You see, who do you think you are? And we went over this question back when we talked about uh, Peter's confession of, of of Jesus being the Christ. But this is a question about Jesus we all need to answer. Who do you think Jesus is? And I bring this up again because this is a really, really important question. Who do you think Jesus is? Jesus knew who he was, but the question is, do you? Do you believe that Jesus is God that came to earth, who died for your sins so that you could be forgiven and live with him for all eternity? This is a significant question, and the answer you give has eternal significance. But for these guys who are confronting Jesus, they don't believe Jesus is anybody. They probably just think he's just some guy, he's got this group of followers, and he's become really popular, and he's, he's gotten so popular they want him to be their king. And, and Jesus doesn't go through the whole, I am God, let me explain this to you. He didn't answer that. Instead, his answer, he turned the tables. And he gives them the clever question, the comeback. Verse 29. Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I'll tell you what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. Okay, every time Jesus is confronted, he's asked a question that was designed to trip him up. So they would say the wrong thing and they could accuse him of a crime. The Pharisees and the Jewish council always made up a trick question, a gotcha question. Jesus here gave them one instead. They don't know how to answer this question about John the Baptist. Was John a real prophet? And what he was teaching and preaching, was that from God or did he make this stuff up on his own? Verse 31, they discussed among themselves and they, they couldn't come up with an answer. They answered Jesus in 33, we don't know. They couldn't give Jesus an answer, so they didn't, give, they didn't get the answer they were seeking. They want to know, Jesus, who do you think you are? Jesus turned the tables and said, what about John the Baptist? Who is he? You see, for these Jewish leaders, it was all about fear of losing control of their fortunes and their power. But it can be that way when you are faced with the question, who is Jesus to you? See, sometimes we fear that, man, you know what, I, I, know, I, I, I know I'm a sinner. 
I believe in Jesus. I, I believe, you know, he, he could save me from my sin. I just need to repent and put my trust in him. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid of a lot of things. I'm afraid of losing control. I'm afraid of losing control of my life. And, and you know, oh my goodness, you know, I, I know I need to change, but oh my goodness, I don't want to be some kind of holy roller radical person that I've seen this happen. I don't want that to happen to me. So what I'm going to do is before I die, that's when I'll, I'll give my life to Christ. Here's the problem with that. You don't know when that's going to be. See, some people are afraid to trust in Jesus because they're not certain how Jesus will change their life. Let me tell you, and I guarantee you, it will be for the better. Amen? Absolutely for the better. Every single time. But the answer needs to be given because here's the thing. Not answering, a neutral response is still an answer. Uh, my favorite rock band is Rush, and they have a song, and one of the lyrics says, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And this is true. If you choose not to decide, you've still made a choice. And a neutral answer is still an answer just like it was here. If you don't answer the question of what you believe about Jesus, you've already answered it that you don't believe. Which means you don't have eternal life in the glorious kingdom. But you can have that right now today. By turning from your sinful ways and turning and trusting in Jesus for him to save you from your sins. Here's the thing. I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir and Y'all have been Christians for a long time, but there might be somebody here this morning that I've been coming to church all this time, but I've never really trusted in Jesus. I've never really made that commitment. I, I believe all that's said every Sunday, but yet I have yet to turn my life over to the Lord. That's scary, and I, I don't want to do that. I will one day. Today's the day, Right? I'll be up front here as we sing our closing song and if the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart and you want to be saved, then, then please come as we sing. Everything that has to do with the Lord Jesus is always better than anything without Him. Let's pray.